message of Nehemiah is our focus today. And the key verse in the book is Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 3. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. So this describes a wonderful revival that took place in the book. Now regarding its setting, the book of Nehemiah covers a period of 20 years from 445 to 425 BC. This is known as the post-exilic period, which just means the period after the return from the exile in Babylon. It was written about 420 BC, and its author is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is best known for his leadership in rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem after the return from exile. Here is the Wycliffe Bible commentary, and it says, no portion of the Old Testament provides us with a greater incentive to dedicated, discerning zeal for the work of God than the book of Nehemiah. All right, now let's go into its structure. There are basically two part, two main parts. Number, part number one, rebuilding the wall in chapters one through seven. And here we'll go down. First of all, God burdens Nehemiah for the work in chapter one. And we see this in two parts. First of all, Nehemiah's pain in chapter, in verses one through four. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So there's Nehemiah's pain that the, the wall that protects the city of Jerusalem is, has been broken down. Next we see Nehemiah's prayer in verses 5 through 11. Then I said, and here comes the prayer. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servant who, servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And the man was the king and he finishes, I was cupbearer to the king. What Nehemiah is praying for is that the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, will allow him, even though he's the cupbearer to the king, to return to Jerusalem and help rebuild the wall. Now the lesson that comes out of chapter one is the steps toward rebuilding our lives for God are experiencing pain over our sins and praying for God's forgiveness and strength. Now into chapter two, God calls Nehemiah to the work. 
God used the king to do this. Now, the lesson is even brief prayers can be powerful. The king gave Nehemiah permission to travel to Jerusalem as a result of Nehemiah's brief dart-like prayer. You know, when you throw a dart, it doesn't stay long in the air. It gets to the target right away. Watch this in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Notice, so I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. I believe that this is the shortest prayer in the whole Bible. The king says, what do you want? And Nehemiah says, well, I said to the king. But right before speaking to the king, he prayed to the God of heaven. I take that prayer as like just looking up. Here we go, God. You know. And then he told the king, I'd like to go back to Jerusalem. More on these kinds of prayers later. Now into chapter 3. God sends Nehemiah into the work. And in chapter 3, we find dozens of names of people who joined him in the work. They were united to get this job done. And the lesson for us is unity is essential if we are to complete a work for God. Unity is uh, very difficult to attain. We, we know that in this life, you know, nothing really is perfect. I remember very soon before we moved into this building right here in 1996, we invested about $2 million into this building, but we needed to borrow one quarter of $1 million. And uh, one of our prominent couples in the church said, no, no, we must not borrow any money. That would be wrong. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Well, we did it anyway. And very sadly for us, they, this couple left us and so forth. Well, that quarter of a million dollars we put on a 10-year mortgage. We paid it off in five years and never asked you for a penny of it. The money just flowed right in. We burned the mortgage in five years. It turned out that the loan, you know, didn't cripple us or wasn't an albatross around our neck in the slightest. But, but nonetheless, it, it, was, it was difficult to lose that couple over that. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the three tenors. One of them has now passed away. Um, Luciana Pavarotti, the other two, forgive me if I mispronounce their names, Jose Carreras and Placido Domingo. Here's an issue of Leadership Magazine uh, from a few years ago, and it talks about the three tenors, and the interviewer asks them, do you ever find yourself competing against one another? Because, you know, they sang together as a trio. And... Uh, Here's what uh, Placido Domingo said. You have to put all of your concentration into opening your heart to the music. You can't be rivals when you're together making music. A good lesson. And it's the same thing in the church, isn't it? We can't be rivals when we're together doing a work for God. We need to be unified. And then into chapter 4 and carrying through chapter 6, God challenges Nehemiah in the work. Now, the way God challenged him was by allowing opposition to come around. And the opposition came from two places. Num number one, from without. Namely, you know, from the outside. And from without in three ways. By, first of all, ridicule in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing 
Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even if a f fox climbed up on it, he would break down their walls of stone. So there is the ridicule. A second discouragement uh, or opposition came from discouragement. In chapter 4, I'll read verses 7 through 10 and then 14. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the the, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this need, this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And then down to 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So there is discouragement going on. And then we've got fear in chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. Quote, there is a king in Judah, end quote. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us confer together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. So the lesson here coming from the opposition from without is this. Here's how I apply that to us. Committed Christians should expect Satan to oppose their work for Christ. Ministry, ministry for Christ can become very frustrating and discouraging at times. God doesn't want us to give up. So there's the opposition from without. Now we have opposition from within. And again, in, in three ways. First of all, by the way things looked. Chapter 4, verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Then they had fear in their hearts. In chapter 4, verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And then third, we have opposition from within by their abuse of their own people. In chapter 5, 1 through 5. 
Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, We and our sons are, and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have, we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. So here we see that the rich were putting the poor in bondage. Now here's the lesson I find in all of this opposition from within. Remember, the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem is, is the big deal in this book. So to build our lives for God, we must keep our eyes off the problem and on the Lord, overcome our fear of Satan with faith in Christ, and love one another. So there's part one in the book, Rebuilding the Wall. Now part two is in chapters 8 to 13, and I call it Reforming the Wayward. And the, the idea in these chapters is, What's the use of building a strong wall around your city if the spiritual lives of the people in the city are broken down? It's one thing to have a broken down wall. Quite another to have broken down people. Now, when it comes to building up the people, mark the emphasis on the scriptures. First of all, in, in chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. All the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Now down to verse 8. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. That's just like a pastor does today, hopefully. And then verse 18. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. So here's an emphasis on the scriptures. And the second emphasis in chapters 8 through 13 is on the house of God. Here's one example of that. Nehemiah 10, 39 says, We will not neglect the house of our God. Now, what does this mean to us? Well, I think the application is pretty simple. Scripture and worship are the keys to rebuilding our spiritual lives, just like it was in the book of Nehemiah. Now, the final main, the final section this morning is its significance. I have five things that are, are very significant from the book of Nehemiah that we can easily apply in our lives. And here's the first. We must strike a balance in our spiritual warfare. Listen to Nehemiah 4, verse 9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So obviously they were praying that God would protect them, but then they also were doing their best to protect themselves by posting a guard 
day and night. One more verse along this line, Nehemiah 4, 17. Who were building the wall, those who carried materials, did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Now imagine that. You're building a wall and you know, you're, you're doing your work putting the bricks in place or whatever it is with one hand and the other hand you got a weapon and you're, you're trying to fight off the opposition here. I mean that is absolutely amazing. Really, You're really doing double duty when, when that comes along, uh, doesn't it? It reminds me of a famous quotation from Dwight Moody. He was the Billy Graham of the 19th century. He died in 1899. Great evangelist. And he said, Dwight Moody said, I'm praying as if everything depended on God and I'm working as if everything depended on me. And that's the balance, I think, that is good to strike in our spiritual warfare. Here's a second prominent lesson that comes out of the book. God answers prayer. I bet you could tell what that blank was, was going to be. God answers prayer. Now, Jerusalem's wall was finished in 52 days. Chapter 6, verse 15 says so. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Now that was a miraculous accomplishment for such a gigantic task as rebuilding the wall all the way around the city of Jerusalem with opposition going on from without, from within, all the time. Now what was the reason for this success? Well, I believe primarily it was Nehemiah's prayers. Now the wonderful thing about Nehemiah's prayers, and you see this throughout the book, is that they were all so brief. You know, I've already described them as, as dart prayers where you just, you know, throw a dart up to God and bang, it hits the target right away. Another label I like to put on these prayers is holy telegrams. You know, when you send a telegram, you just use a couple of words. You don't, you don't get verbose and all over the place. And Nehemiah had these telegram prayers in, uh, in his life uh, th throughout the book. Now, we've already looked at chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, but let's look at it again. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. And he goes on and answers the king. So again, I, I think that's probably the briefest prayer in the entire Bible. He, he just kind of looked up to God and, and answered the king. I don't think the king noticed that Nehemiah was pausing to pray. I don't think there really was a, a time pause there. He just threw up that telegram. Here's another example of a holy telegram, chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Now that's a longer prayer, but still it's a brief one. It, it, it doesn't go on and on. Chapter 5, verse 19 is the next one. Remember me with favor, O oh my God, for all I have done for these people. See how brief that is? The next one is in chapter 6, verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking, their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. In English, at least, that's a four-word prayer. Now strengthen my hands hands. Uh, a holy telegram. Chapter 6 verse 14 is the next one. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. Brief prayer. Then over in chapter 13, 
verse 14, we, uh, we have the next one. Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Right to the point. Chapter 13, verse 22 is the next one. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Now here comes the prayer. Remember me for this also, O my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Very brief. Verse 29 is the last holy telegram in the book. Remember them, O my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Here's my book, They Knew How to Pray, 15 Secrets from the Prayer Lives of Bible Heroes. I have a chapter in here on the prayer life of Nehemiah, and, and the, the secret from, from Nehemiah's prayer life is send God holy telegrams. By way of his example, that's what he tells us to do. Let me read to you this little poem I found written by James Montgomery in 1818 that I quote in this chapter on Nehemiah. And it, it describes these holy telegrams. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. The motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye, when none but God is near. See how, how, how brief that is? It, it, it shouldn't be the only kind of prayer we ever make. But it should be, the, it's a good way to, you know, maintain that spirit of prayer. Here's another good example of dart prayers or holy telegrams. This is a poem written by Greg Asimakopoulos called One Word Prayer. Here's how to pray in one word. And, and the one word prayer, the, the one word in his prayer that he's talking about here is just the word Jesus. You just say Jesus. All right, listen to this. I just breathe the name of Jesus when my heart is filled with fear. And though I cannot see his face, I know that he is near. When I whisper Jesus softly, I'm admitting I'm in need. By calling out that precious name, my stress-bound soul is freed. It's a one-word prayer I utter when I'm not sure what to pray. It's a prayer of sweet surrender when I'm weary of my way. I pray Jesus when I'm worried or when I am depressed. I say Jesus when my mind's confused and when my life's a mess. It's a prayer he always answers as he gives me eyes to see evidences of his presence and his tender love for me. So there's a good, good way to pray. All you got to do is say Jesus. By the way, I remember I was a teenager and we were, I was in a car uh, driving up to Mount Hermon from our church, which was in Redwood City. I was like in the youth group. And driving the car was this, you know, adult woman in our church. And she was very, very godly. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I had her speak right here in our church. Uh, she wrote a book called uh, Buffeted But Blessed about abuse that she endured, so forth. Uh, Norma Wilson, maybe you remember, but it was a long time ago. Anyway, so she's driving this car. And, you know, four or five teenagers are in the car. And traffic gets heavy on the 17 freeway toward Mount Hermon. So we're kind of, you know, stopped. And all of a sudden, bang, right in back, we get rear-ended by this other car. And as soon as we got rear-ended, I heard Norma, the driver, the, the only adult in the car. 
she said, Jesus! And when she said that, because I'm a teenager, I thought she was cursing. Like, oh, I got my car just hit in the back, you know? Jesus! Uh, that's the way teenagers hear it and say it, you know? Not that I said it, I, you know, but I heard this a lot at school. And then it occurred to me later on, she wasn't cursing at all. She wasn't taking God's name in vain at all. She was calling out to Jesus. And I told her that too. I told her this whole story of how, you know. And, and she said, oh, that's right. I, I was just calling out to Jesus. And we were all okay in the car. No, no permanent injury. But anyway, there you are. God answers prayer. Here's a third big lesson. God blesses godly leaders. The people rallied around Nehemiah, withstood opposition, and finished the job in 52 days. Nehemiah was a godly leader because he was a man of prayer. He persevered through discouraging situations, and he did not let his enemies stop him, and he was able to get others to work for God. Here is J. Oswald Sanders' book, Spiritual Leadership. It's a really good book. He draws some parallels here, which are actually contrasts between natural leadership, leadership in the world, and spiritual leadership. Listen to this. The natural leader is self-confident. The spiritual leader is confident in God. The natural leader knows people. The spiritual leader also knows God. The natural leader makes his own decisions. The spiritual leader seeks to find God's will. The natural leader is ambitious. The spiritual leader is self-effacing. The natural leader originates his own methods. The spiritual leader finds and follows God's methods. The natural leader enjoys commanding others. The spiritual leader delights to obey God. The natural leader is motivated by personal considerations. The spiritual leader is motivated by love for God and people. The natural leader is independent. The spiritual leader is God-dependent. So the point is, when we talk about leadership, which the book of Nehemiah does illustrate very well, we're not uh, talking about the same kind of leadership that sometimes we see in the world. All right, now number four. Believers who serve Christ in non-glamorous areas are still doing ministry for him. Now here in the church, maybe some of the non-glamorous areas are uh, our church kitchen staff, custodians, secretaries, the maintenance people, people who run errands, people who fix leaky roofs. Just on Friday, we had a sprinkler that was running and couldn't, wouldn't turn off, and we called Doug Regeer down here, and he came down and got the sprinkler turned off. You know, it was flooding all kinds of water before we discovered it, and it's out there in the parking lot and so forth. That's a very non-glamorous thing to do. How about being the financial secretary? being on the building committee and so forth. Uh, but the encouragement is that an entire book in the Bible, Nehemiah, is devoted to people who served God in a non-glamorous way by rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. We broke ground on this building right here on May 15th, 1994. We didn't move in until August of 1996. It took us about two and a quarter years to build this uh, church facility. The reason it took so long is that we tried to do as much volunteer labor as we possibly could. I myself did a little bit of volunteer labor, digging some ditches, laying rebar and so forth, but you know, not really a, a great, great deal. We did have a bunch of guys, though, who came down every day during those uh, five days a week during those two and a quarter years, mostly retired people, 
like the late Chet Ferris and Nelson Grover and Lee Brandon and a handful of other guys, some of whom have now passed away, and they came down and did all these kind of everything they could do, manual labor and so forth. For more than a year, we also had eight guys on the inside of the church at night. And these were not retired people, these were younger people who worked all day and for more than a year they came down here at night and laid all the uh, electrical wire throughout the entire church. Uh, um, and uh, Howard McCain, one of our members, was an electrician himself. He guided the men through all of this. They all did it volunteer. Well, anyway, all of these people who worked during the day and at night, I nicknamed the Thousand Hour Club because all of these people put in well over a thousand hours each of volunteer labor for those two and a quarter years. Now, when we moved in in 1996, this place was valued at $3 million, but we paid only $2 million for it. And basically, we saved a million dollars by using volunteer labor. And that thousand hour club, just, they didn't serve in any glamorous ways. They were running errands and and you know measuring things and digging things and hammering things and all that kind of thing it involved a lot of sweat but believers who serve Christ in non-glamorous areas are still doing ministry for him and that was wonderful ministry and then a fifth and final big lesson out of the book is this think twice before you try to stop a work for God the names of Sanballat, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem are forever written in Scripture, in this book, as enemies of God's work. Watch out, lest you become the next Sanballat, Tobiah, or Geshem. I heard about a church where there was tremendous unity among the people, and they would, in their business meetings, all sense that God was leading them a certain way, and they would all, you know, be unified and vote for that except for one person who always voted against everything and it just so happened that this one person voting against everything was the uh, church secretary clerk who took the minutes of the meetings and all and she, she would always say I all opposed I she was the only one well, the pastor got, you know, very frustrated by all this, and this was his secretary clerk, and so he, he told her, he says, you know, the rest of us all feel like God is leading us a certain way, and you're, you're always against it. You always vote against it. Well, why do you do that? And she said, because I don't know how to spell the word unanimous. <laughs> Which just goes to show, my point in that story is that people will oppose the work of God for, for very flimsy reasons. Back in 1986, we were talking about building this building. And I remember at one of our businesses, this was a hotly debated thing. And at our final business meeting where we voted that, yes, we're going to launch out on a building program. We were down at the other church less than about one twentieth the size of, of the land we have here and so forth. So we finally passed the motion. We were off on the building program and one of our members stood up after the vote and he said to the congregation, you mark my words, there is never going to be some building out there on Nebraska Avenue. That is a pipe dream. And he withdrew his membership and left the church, and a few people followed him and left the church at the same time, too, and agreed with him. Well, it really wasn't a pipe dream. It really did come about. And I've already told you before a couple of years ago when it happened, more than 20 years later after 1986, and he said that, 
This same man who now lives in Northern California sent me a letter and apologized for opposing our building program and so forth, asking my forgiveness. It just really broke my heart when I, when I read that letter and I, I wrote him right back and you know, gave him my forgiveness and we're friends again and all of this and that. But you know, for years there, look, look at the fellowship he missed out on. Over in Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39, Gamaliel says to the Jews, Therefore in the present case I advise you, leave these men alone, the apostles. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. In closing, I want to say, just like Nehemiah said in this book, I'm doing a great work for God. I'm thankful that we're doing a great work for God too. We're declaring the gospel. We're declaring, proclaiming God's word. We're seeing people come to Christ. We're building disciples. We're advancing God's kingdom. We're plucking people out of captivity from Satan into the Lord's family. We are exalting Christ and we're glorifying God. Thank you for partnering with me in this great work for God. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be right there with Nehemiah and just like he was doing a great work for God so we can do that today too. And thank you that because our labor is in the Lord, it's never a waste of our time or effort. It's never in vain. We're so grateful for that, dear God. And thank you for our King, Jesus, whom we serve so lovingly and whose love we enjoy. So help us, Lord, to Continue advancing your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Today,